Hi, welcome to chapter 21, heat rate and boiler efficiency. We're going to talk a little bit about heat rate calculations using the input-output method. In other words, looking at the heat input to the unit, which is basically the calorific value of the fuel times the fuel flow. And then we're going to move on to look at the boiler efficiency by the heat loss method and what are some of the factors that we can actually influence. The heat rate of a unit is essentially the energy going in divided by the energy going out. So our basic heat rate calculation has the calories per hour or the BTUs per hour going into the unit and then divided by the electrical output. If this is an electrical generating station, we look at the electrical output and we divide those two numbers and we get what's called the heat rate generally in BTUs per kilowatt hour or megajoules per kilowatt hour or kilocalories per kilowatt hour. There are two heat rates that can be generated and they basically use the gross generator output, the net station output. The gross output of the generator is the total megawatts of electricity being produced by the generator from the steam flow. And then the auxiliary power is all those things like the coal yard, pulverizers, fans, scrubbers, pumps, all these things that it takes to make a power plant run. So we actually can't sell that electricity, so we add that up, we call it aux power, auxiliary power, and we subtract it from the gross generation to get the net load available for sale. The total calories going into a boiler is found relatively simple if you know the calorific value of the coal and the coal flow rate. So if you have uh, samples of coal that you've taken and uh, feeders that measure in tons or pounds per hour, you can readily calculate coal flow times calorific value. There are some issues associated with the heat input to a boiler. One is, is that coal sampling actually doesn't do that good of a job in terms of accuracy. Depending on how you go about taking the sample, uh, really can influence the accuracy of those numbers. And if you have a high moisture coal where sampling might influence the moisture levels of the coal or a high ash coal where the sampling might influence the actual ash level that you get, uh, you will get erroneous numbers using this method. But trying the best that we can, if we can take a good coal sample, maybe we're within two, three, four percent of the actual calorific value. It'd be a normalized curve, so we're going to get about the average. Hopefully we're not biased one way or the other. And then the issue with the coal feeders is that they're not calibrated using a material test. To actually make a feeder a scale or a metering device a scale, we have to take a statically weighed known weight of material and put it over that belt and then calibrate the belt to that known weight. When we put the chains on or we electronically calibrate, we're making sure the system is functioning properly, but we're not actually getting it that accurate in terms of weight measurement. So again, two, three percent probably is the best we can hope for. Uh, it's usually not the quarter percent. The quarter percent comes from the equipment in there. If you did a material test, could actually weigh that same material, same material within a quarter percent. And then of course the issue is that you're multiplying one kind of fuzzy number by another fuzzy number and the output of that is going to be a very fuzzy number. In terms of trying to get a coal sample, uh, if you regularly take daily coal samples, you've probably got a good feel what your coal runs. When you go out and take a special heat rate or special boiler efficiency coal sample, you would like for those coal samples to sort of match up with the coals that you were expecting and not be way off or at least have answers as to why this coal quality doesn't match up with typical coal qualities. Here's an example of my concern with the accuracy of coal sampling. Not the testing in the laboratory, but the actual getting the sample itself. ASTM says it's plus or minus 10% of the actual dry ash value. Well, what about moisture, I asked. They said it was probably worse, we don't want to talk about moisture. So I'm going to use that plus or minus 10% on a 30 moisture coal. And what I get is plus or minus 3% of the moisture. When I look at the impact 
on the calorific value. In this case, I use BTUs, but when I look at the impact of a 3% swing of moisture on the calorific value, I can see that on an 8,500 BTU coal, it's, 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 all, it's over 360 BTUs per pound. And then on top of that, that's just a sampling air for moisture. I can add, and usually these high moisture coals have low ash, but I can add another plus or minus half percent if I have a 5% dry ash coal. And then calorific value measurement is probably only within about 50, 100 BTUs per pound or divide by 1.8 to get the calorific value, plus or minus. That's the laboratory plus or minus. We have to add all this sampling plus or minus on top of that. You'll have some additional material to this class that describes some of the inaccuracy on the calorific value. There generally is no issues with measuring the electric side or the generator output and the auxiliary power to calculate your gross and net load values. I also wanted to mention that this is the input-output method for calculating heat rate. We're basically just looking at the coal in and the electric out. When we do the boiler efficiency by the output-input method, what we have to do is actually measure all the steam conditions and steam flows in addition to the coal flow and a coal sample. Because of the inaccuracies associated with flow measurements, Typically, we don't get very consistent numbers using the output-input method for boil efficiency. So most people don't use that method. What they use is a standardized ASME power test code 4.1 boil efficiency by the heat loss method. When I look at the basic losses associated with the heat loss method, I come up with these categories. We have to worry about moisture. If the moisture comes in at ambient temperatures and leaves at stack temperatures. It's gone through a phase change going from water to steam. That latent heat of vaporization represents quite a bit of calorific value. So we need to know the moisture in the air, the moisture in the coal, and the moisture formed from the combustion of hydrogen in the coal. Those impacts of moisture on the efficiency of the boiler do add up to be a significant number. We're gonna look at unburnt coal or carbon in the ash. Sometimes we call it the LOI, stands for loss on ignition. But we're basically gonna be looking at the ash to find out if there's any unburnt coal or unburnt carbon in the ash. That's a loss. If the unburnt carbon is high, there's a boiler efficiency penalty associated with not burning all the coal. Another big one is the latent heat of the flue gas. And so this has to do with both the amount of flue gas and the temperature of the flue gas, or essentially the enthalpy of the flue gas. That flue gas leaving the boiler has a much higher enthalpy than the air coming into the boiler. And so by doing the math around the enthalpy of the air in and the gas out, we can come up with a dry gas loss. In other words, we heated up a bunch of nitrogen in the air and now we're sending it out of the boiler at a hot, uh, in a hot condition. We would like to look at that loss. There are several other losses that would be included in the official test. Uh, radiation loss, that mostly has to do with the size of the boiler. Large boilers have less of a loss than small boilers. And then there's always at the end an unaccounted for or about a percent of boiler efficiency, sometimes even called the boiler manufacturer's margin. To run a boiler efficiency test, you're gonna need a coal sample. You need ash samples to do the LOI test on. We need to know the excess O2 and excess air levels. We also have to get a good appreciation of the air heater leakage. And then we'll be measuring temperatures of the air in and gas out around that air heater with the idea that we have to correct that gas out temperature before we do the math utilizing their heat or leakage. So going back to the losses associated with the heat loss method, the moisture in the air, there's not a lot you can do about it. If you live in a dry, cold environment, you probably have less of a loss than somebody living in a damp, moist, more humid environment. But there's nothing you can do about that at your plant. And it is quite a small loss. The moisture in the fuel can represent a substantial loss and this is where we're going to look a little bit about what are you doing to try to manage the moisture levels of the fuel that you burn. Hydrogen is only about 
three, four, five percent of the weight of coal, but it only weighs one, and when we burned hydrogen to water, it now weighs 18. So the H2 gas is what we might call it, plus an oxygen going to 18, means that the mass of water generated from burning a kilogram of hydrogen is like nine times the mass of the hydrogen. So if you have 4% hydrogen in your gas, 4 times 9, 36, that 4% hydrogen in your coal, found in the ultimate analysis, represents 36% moisture. The unburnt carbon can be a big loss if indeed the unburnt carbon is high. And then of course, the dry gas loss can be high if you're using a lot of extra airflow, particularly if you're using high oxygen to try to burn the carbon, uh, you may actually find that the penalty for the dry gas loss is more than the penalty for the carbon loss. So we can't do much about the moisture in the air, and we can't do much about the radiation and the unaccounted for losses. So I'm going to sort of de-emphasize those and look at things that we might be able to do something about. Well, there's not a lot that we can do with the hydrogen in the coal. So the three areas that we mostly can look at in looking at how to change or improve the boiler efficiency using the heat loss method is associated with the moisture levels in the fuel and are you trying to keep the coal dry, the unburnt carbon loss or any unburnt coal, and then the dry gas loss or how much air and excess air are you using to operate this boiler. So those three components are what we're going to look at. Okay, so let's look at moisture in the fuel. I mean, most of our fuel is stored in, outside, and many of us live in high rainfall areas. Uh, do we make any sort of attempt to cover the pile? Do we try to keep rain off of our pile? Do we try to keep it well-groomed? Are we compacting the pile and trying to not allow the moisture to penetrate it? You can see that we can actually get increases of moisture just in storage of two, three, four, five percent. And remember, for every 10 percent change in moisture, it represents one percent boiler efficiency. So if you let a coal go from 22 percent up to 27 percent moisture, you are incurring a half percent boiler efficiency penalty associated with that gain of moisture in the coal. You have to use the energy in the primary air or the furnace itself to dry that. Another area that can be significant is the unburnt carbon loss. Uh, to put it very simply, if you have a 10% ash coal that has 10% carbon in it, or 10% LOI, well that 10 times the 0.1 equals a 1% loss, or you're not burning 1% of your coal. Now if you have half percent ash coal, that 10% would, that LOI would knock it down to a half percent loss. Uh, what we really want to try to strive is to get that carbon in the ash certainly below numbers like 1 and 2 if you're burning a subbituminous or lignite coal and certainly below 5% if it's a bituminous or higher rank coal. What influences unburnt carbon loss the most I would say is particle size and lack of air. So particle size is all about the pulverizer coal fineness. Lack of air can generally come from imbalance of combustion. If I have imbalanced coal pipes due to large particle sizes, let's say, I'm going to have more coal and less air on this side and less coal and more air on this side, so I end up with an O2 split. That is an air and coal distribution issue, so we have to either try to overcome that by raising all the air up or try to get the pulverizers more balanced. Coal ash levels also impact the carbon loss. Like I mentioned, if you have a 10% ash coal, a 10% LOI is 1% unburnt carbon. But if you only have a 5 ash coal, a 10% LOI is more like only a half percent carbon loss. If you have a typical Indonesian subbituminous coal spec of less than 5 ash and you get LOI numbers of less than 1%, you can see the unburnt carbon portion of the heat loss is going to be very low. I've prepared this chart of excess oxygen versus boiler efficiency, and we're looking at two specific losses. We're looking at the carbon loss, which is the blue line, and you can see that it's high with the low O2 values, but then it goes down to zero and stays flat for all the rest of the O2 values. 
As the oxygen levels in the flue gas increase, the amount of excess air also increases. And this is rapidly, like each 1% represents, you know, 6-7% uh, more airflow. Rapidly, when you raise the O2, you rapidly hurt the boiler efficiency. So the dry gas loss is represented by the red line. And you can see the more oxygen you put in, the more dry gas you get. And also notice that it looks a little bit exponential. In other words, a 1% change of oxygen in the 2 to 3 range does not represent near the penalty that you pay from going from like 6 to 7%. This is one of the reasons why our heat rate suffers so much at low loads because we typically run with high oxygen levels, 6 or 7%, to maintain the reheat temperatures. If I add those two penalties together and look at the impact on the boiler efficiency, in other words, I'm subtracting from 100 in this case, I've also got those other parameters included so it looks like a real boiler efficiency. But what you see is that when you have the high carbon at the 0 or 1% excess oxygen, you get a big loss. And then somewhere around 2 or 3% oxygen, you get your maximum efficiency because now the carbon is burnt. But then as you add more oxygen, as you add more excess air to the situation, you really hurt that dry gas loss. And so you can see that all you can do from that 2 or 3% oxygen level is go down in efficiency when you run 4, 5, 6% oxygen. So we covered that a little bit, the dry gas loss, which is really the amount and the temperature of the flue gas heading towards the stack, or once it leaves where there's heat recovery equipment on the boiler side. The number one item that really impacts that dry gas loss is the high oxygen levels or the high excess air levels. If we have slags or deposits, and particularly in the convection pass or deposits in the air heater, we can certainly cause uh, heat transfer issues, and therefore we don't absorb as much of the flue gas heat as we can. And this is a boiler efficiency loss is caused by higher temperatures leaving the boiler and as a result of deposits formed either in the furnace, the convection pass, or in the air heater. And then, of course, if we're suffering from high air heater leakage, it will look like we have a cool flue gas. In other words, the cold air from the FD fan leaks over to the ID side. It cools the gas and makes it look cool, but those higher air heater leakages are actually causing quite a bit of penalty because we have to correct that flue gas exit gas temperature. So in looking at the dry gas loss, we're basically comparing the temperatures or the enthalpy of the air entering the system and the gas leaving the system. Here's a chart that represents the boiler efficiency versus that exit gas temperature. And you can see that you lose about 1% boiler efficiency for every 37 degrees Fahrenheit or about 20 degrees Celsius higher temperature on that flue gas temperature than what the design numbers are. So putting a couple of these concepts of boiler efficiency together and then overlaying the fact that what we really need to do in many cases is fire for NOx control, we can actually tune for NOx. And this is where having balanced pipe, coal pipe uh, concentrations and having balanced air flows can really help us in a NOx tuning situation. In other words, if we shoot for an average of three oxygen, and all the O2 probes are reading 3 in the back, that's a better situation if we have a 1 and a 5 O2 probes averaging to 3%. In other words, you're going to get low knocks here, but much higher knocks over on the 5% side. So balancing is almost critical to knocks firing. So because we're actually trying to detune the flame a little bit, it's best to have an O2 knock CO grid work in the back end so you can look what burner adjustments or flame adjustments might be doing to you. When we're trying to get rid of carbon, I mentioned the pulverizers is probably being one of the biggest impacts, but also looking at the amount of air that a flame is getting impacts the amount of carbon burnout there is. Typically to improve the carbon in the fly ash, we're going to want to raise oxygen levels or, and or cut back on the overfire air levels. This should help your carbon utilization, but it will also increase potential your NOx levels. This is where the payoff with pulverizer fineness seems to really pay off because if we can get good fineness, we can get good combustion and good carbon utilization.
and still operate in those lower oxygen and overfire air situations that low NOx firing requires. And then I mentioned slag and ash deposits as being a cause for higher furnace exit gas temperatures. And certainly you can tune a boiler to try to minimize slags. So what we typically are going to be doing again is putting the air back in the boiler, NOx goes up, but you might even see the flame and or the FEGT come down and certainly cleaner walls if you get into that situation. We want to worry about the burner velocity also. Sometimes those low calorific, high moisture type coals can really get to where we're exceeding the design velocities coming out of the pipe into the burners. And then for all deposit controls, it's very important to have your cleaning equipment operational and functioning correctly. So your retract soot blowers, your wall blowers, the water cannons or water removal devices, all this type of equipment should be operational and utilized to try to control and combat these deposits in the boiler. And as I mentioned before, looking at those pulverizers as being an option, uh, if we can get good fineness and get the pipe-to-pipe -pipe cold distribution balanced, we can do a much better job at tuning that flame to minimize NOx, minimize carbon loss, and minimize ash deposits. Okay, thank you. There's a little introduction to heat rate by the input-output method and some of the issues I have with coal flow and calorific value of the coal. We basically decided that using input-output of boiler efficiency gets even worse because we're trying to measure steam flows as opposed to electric flow. So we use the heat loss method. We narrowed down the heat loss method to three factors that we actually can control. Moisture in the fuel, trying to keep the fuel dry, or at least trying to find some drier fuel instead of just loading in wet fuel. We talked about the carbon loss and trying to keep the carbon down in the ash. And then finally, we talked about that furnace exit gas temperature and the impact that the dry gas loss has on the boiler efficiency. Thanks again. Let's move on to the next chapter.